Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Saturday edition of the Paranormal Portal. I'm your host, Brent Thomas, and we are live and underway here. This is live and unrehearsed, live and unscripted, and live and just barely in control, as far as I can tell. <laughs> but it is the portal, and uh, you've come to the right place for all the paranormal mayhem your body could desire. So welcome to the show, everybody. And uh, of course, I'm not alone here. I've got to my right hand is my good friend and co-host, Mr. Don Longbeard. Oh, isn't that so nice? Flying by the edge of our pants. That's usually how we do things around here. <laughs> uh, I don't even know what to say to that. I, 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 I'd like to think it's well-planned and well-rehearsed. Uh, I would be lying, of let's, course. Let's not confuse us with a professional crew. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're professional... Uh, ish. 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 <laughs> Something like that. But... Uh, I, how you doing, buddy? Doing good, doing good. Uh, the weekend is here. I had the day off, and tomorrow it's back to the grind. Of, back to the grind. Back to the grind. Oh, uh, you poor soul. But, you know, I mean, life goes on, you know? And uh, so here we are. We're we're about to have a great show and uh, with all of our friends and uh, have a great guest, so it's going to be good. It is going to be good, and our great guest tonight, ladies and gentlemen, is uh, it's this, this gentleman's first appearance on the portal, but he's... Uh, been around for a while now and uh, taken part in the chats and uh, uh, has become a great friend in a very short period of time. But it's my great pleasure to introduce to you guys Mr. Duke Sullivan of World Bigfoot Radio. Welcome to the show, Duke. Howdy, everybody out there. Big Sky Howdy from the Foggy Mountains of Montana. Hope everybody's doing great. Ah, they are. At least that's what they told me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they are. Um, and how could they not be with uh, with a guest like you on the show? And, and this is your first appearance, but it's one that I'm absolutely thrilled about because you are one of the people I've been listening to for a long time. You know, I was listening to you, way, you know, way back when you were uh, over with Wes on uh, uh, Sasquatch Chronicles. I've listened to your World Bigfoot Radio. And you've just got this amazing insight and amazing, uh, you know, in, in knowledge base regarding these really elusive beings. And it's been a great pleasure to listen to you. And now it's a, a great personal pleasure to have the ch opportunity to meet you and to work with you. So this is just a dream come true for me, brother. Wow. Um, you know, I don't even know how to respond to that. I'm just an ordinary <laughs> guy with a weird job. You know, but <laughs> really appreciate the fact that you like what I'm putting out and that you've been paying so much attention to it. I try and get the best information I can and put it out there and, you know, let, let the people um, decide what they think about it. It's, it's up to them to decide if they believe it or they don't believe it or they believe part of it or, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. That's not my job. I would have to be like the ultimate knowledgeable person i would have to literally know everything about every par paranormal thing there is to know in order to decide 100 percent if somebody that was potentially going to be on my show was telling me the truth or not or yeah. even had their facts right even regardless of if they were telling me the truth or not yep. so it you know it's like um since i'm not in the position let's take bigfoot for example i don't know everything there is to know about bigfoot nobody does mm -hmm. maybe there's some guy that does it works for the government wears a white lab coat he's not telling anybody about it so unless I'm that guy, by what virtue do I have the, uh, you know, hopping the high horse and saying, well, I know everything about Bigfoot and I don't believe you. You're not going to be on my show. Right. No, I and, and I, you know, we've run into that, too, of course, here on the show. And and it, it, the thing that's occurred to me is that there is for all of the people that are, you know, um, and I hate to use this term in regards to the paranormal because I don't believe there are any legitimately, but there are a lot of quote unquote experts in this field mm -hmm. and they they have a very diverse and widespread opinion on the subject. But for every one of those people, there are so many detractors saying they're absolutely full of garbage and they're, you know, uh, they're attacking them, they're degrading them. And this is something that's become a real trend in, in, you know, the Bigfoot community for certain, but, um, in, in a lot of areas in our modern era. And it's, it's disconcerting because, it, it you almost feel like you just don't know what to believe anymore because no matter what you decide to look into, there's somebody saying, no, that's that's a bunch of bunk. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a active attempts by certain uh, <clears throat> quarters to discredit people mm -hmm. and to cause chaos in the community. There's no question of that in my mind. 
uh, disinformation, mm -hmm. cause yep. people to fight with each other so they won't, uh, you know, actually work together or anything. Right. I mean, you know, if you think about it, whoever is suppressing this, their worst nightmare is that really good researchers will start talking to each other instead of fighting with each other. You know, yes. and, and that's something we've been talking about a lot lately in these last couple of weeks with all of our guests that we've had on, Linda Godfrey, Kat Hansen, you know, um, uh, um, Robin uh, Moonshadow, you know, even Cindy Goodbreak, you know. And <clears throat> I got on a soapbox the other day and said something about, you know, we've got to stop, you know, this infighting and, and come to a common, you know, common consensus about, you know, what do we really believe is out there? You know, if you don't like my view, well, then take what you want, leave the rest. You know, you don't have to agree with me 100%. And that's where we need to be. And that's not just, you know, the cryptic community. It's the paranormal community. It's politics. It's all of it. And it's all connected in that sense. But we've been talking about the duality of it for a long time. And and uh, you're, you're absolutely right. We've got to stop this backstabbing stuff because we are our own discreditors, as you said. You know, we debunk ourselves you know, so, well, we should debunk ourselves to a certain point, you know, but, uh, well, there's some stuff that, you know, like you're talking about like, uh, photo evidence and video and stuff. Right. There's some stuff that for sure is it's fake. There's people sure. in a, a monkey suit or somebody made some kind of a prop that looks like a monster and they got a picture of it. And it's like, no, sure. No. Well, you know, there are, there are those people that disinformation people, you know, they're in everything, everything from commercials to TV to radio to just everyday life, you know, and, you just got to figure out a way around them, you know? Yeah. And that's, again, what it's, it, it is incumbent on the listener to do their own research. Right. And this applies yep. to everything, politics, news, Bigfoot, whatever. You've got to go check out. I'm sorry, you can't be lazy anymore. You've got to go check yep. out the sources. Mm -hmm. If you want to believe them after that, cool. Now you've got somebody that you can listen to. If you think they're full of it, then, you know, you shouldn't waste your time listening to them anymore. Right. But ultimately, that's the only way that you can really get viable information anymore. You've got to, you know, check into the people that you're getting the information from, you know, see how much of it seems to ring true with what you already know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Do your own research. You can't just expect anymore that you're going to be able to sit back and be spoon fed information right. and expect that it's going to be accurate. Because, you know, certain people put a lot of money into their budget to make sure that we don't get accurate information, especially in mainstream media. Right. Very true. Very good, very good advice and, and wise words. Um, how long have you been doing this? Which part of it? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I've, I've known cryptids were real since 1972. I didn't get actively interested in doing any research on them until about 1977. And, and how did you know they were real in 72? What was that pivotal moment for you? Because <laughs> I was born the year before. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the bearded, uh, the bearded. I was out was sledding. Uh, this is northern Minnesota. It okay. was uh, February, a couple of weeks before. It had been the all-time record cold temperature in the county next to us, minus fifty-two ambient. So <laughs> since it was only twenty below, we were like, "Woohoo, heat wave! Let's go sledding!" <laughs> and uh, yeah, I mean, seriously, after it's like thirty degrees warmer. Yay! Let's go. Sledding, let's go sledding. <laughs> So we had uh, found this place, and I've, I've told this story a few times before. I don't know if you want me to do the, the whole thing again. Sure, well, yeah. just whatever you want to. I just know that it'll give an opportunity uh, for you to introduce yourself to our, our people that may yeah. not be familiar with you. Well, me and one of my friends decided to go back sledding, and uh, we had found this huge, huge hill way back in the woods, unfortunately. It was on a fire break, uh -huh. and the only reason the fire break didn't go any further is because it dead-ended in about 100-yard quagmire that they literally couldn't get any machinery across to continue making one. Wow. So it was like, why, why make it go any further? This is as far as it's going to go. Okay. Um, but during the winter, when the quagmire is frozen over, you could lay on your sled and get across it. So we did and got over to the far side and looked at it and went, wow, this is a huge hill. And I walked up to the top of it and went, there's another huge hill on top of it. And went to the top of that one and went, holy bleep, there's a huge hill on top of this one. <laughs> this thing is gigantic. This is bigger than the lower ski hill, the, the local ski hill all the kids like to go to. And the snowmobiles and everything. Like, And nobody knows this thing's out here. Nobody's been to it. This is awesome. So we decided we were going to build this totally awesome uh, luge run. And, you know, we, the day we were out there, like I said, it was it was good and cold, but... We, uh, you know, packed the supers on it and everything to make sure that when we got up to ridiculous speed, which would be like about halfway down the first of the three hills, you'd actually make the turns because these hills weren't like lined up with each other. You had to turn twice oh. to get down to the bottom. 
and it was all wooded. It's all, you know, it's woods. It's never been cut down. <laughs> There's giant trees. So, Leo, you know, we got about three and a half, four feet of snow that we're uh, futzing around in here and packed ourselves a trail up to the top of the hill and then started building the sledding run on that. And I think we were out there for like three or four hours and we got it pretty well put together. And then, well, it's almost dark. We need to go back. So that... I want to say it's the following weekend, but it seems to me like it was only a few days later, maybe two or three days later. Um, my buddy Dave showed up again and went, hey, let's let's go out and try out the sledding run. It's actually got warm and melted once in between, which it had. Oh, nice. So it's probably nice and hard now, perfect for luge run. Let's go check it out. So we went out there, and we got out there about mid-afternoon. It was probably about 2 in the afternoon. And uh, since this thing was, like, super steep and dangerous, there was only two of us out there, and the opportunity to get wrapped around a tree was very real, we decided that even at 10 years old, we'd be smart about this, and only one of us would go down the hill at once. <laughs> and the other one would stand by in case we needed medical care. <laughs> so so we tried to do a couple slow runs down the hill, and I mean, like, you know, dragging your legs and sure. putting your arms out and slowing yourself down, and it was still scary fast. Oof. And then uh, I was going up for the, I think it was my third try, and I was going to try and go really fast this time down the hill. And I got up to the top of the hill, and I had my little runway up there on the edge of the cliff that I was looking over going, man, this is going to be really dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> and I noticed that something was wrong. I had turned around when I came up to the top of the hill to put my sled down and sort of, you know, just by nature of having to perform that motion, had scanned the top of the hill because my eye line went across it. And I realized that I put my sled down that there was something wrong. It looked different on the top of the hill than the previous time I had been up there. So I turned back around and looked again, and I still couldn't really figure out what it was, and I was going to jump on my sled. And then it was like I had this, like, feeling something was really wrong. Ooh. And I turned around and looked, and the whole top of the hill, right, right in that part before it dropped off to go down the backside, which I had never seen and probably never will, um, was mostly all hardwoods, except for over on the right-hand side, there was a huge black spruce. And I realized what had caught my attention is the black spruce had three trunks on it. Oh. And two two of them had hair on it. <laughs> and I went, well, that ain't right. And it had this, you know, six, eight-inch long hair that had, like, little snow dingle balls all compacted into it. Oh. And it was kind of a grayish-white anyway, so it blended in really good. And it looked a lot like a gray tree trunk with, like, maybe some snow blown on it and stuff, uh -huh. except for the hair thing. And the first thing that, that hit my mind is, well, it's somebody out here with the snowmobile pants on. Because at that time, they actually had snowmobile pants out on the market. They had, like, fake fur on the other side. Oh, okay. I don't know what they thought that was going to do <laughs> any good insulation-wise, but they, they, <laughs> there was such a thing. And I was just like, oh, man, one of the local kids found our trail out here. They found our awesome sledding hill. The whole thing is ruined. This is terrible. And now they're sitting here spying on us and probably getting ready to throw snowballs at us or something so the bottom most uh branches were probably three four feet up probably closer to yeah three three four feet up okay so i figured if i looked up far enough that i'd see somebody's face peeking through the branches at me so of course i just turned my gaze up to about where you know five six feet was and there was nobody's face there mm -hmm. and i'm like huh well they're just hiding behind the tree and then i realized a little bit higher up there was like rustling so I turned my gaze up a little bit higher, and about at the nine-foot mark, there was this incredibly hideous face looking at me. Oh, no. Oh, man. And it had just a second where it had this expression on its face like, oh, I'm busted. <laughs> you know, like the kid with his hand caught in the cookie jar. For just like maybe half a second flashed across his face, and then he grinned at me. And oh. this thing had a really wide mouth. You know, its head could like, it, its mouth could swallow a basketball. Oh, and it had teeth that looked like a friggin' shark shark not like you know giant chicklets like patty and some of the other big flick get described as you wow. know oh, they got teeth kind of like ours only giant this thing had nothing like that it looked like a bear trap oh my god and uh you know i've since learned that any of the higher primates or even monkeys and stuff if they grin at you it's not hey i think you're funny it's these are one of the weapons that I'm going to use to rip you to shred very soon. <laughs> Copy that, Commander. <laughs> um, and even at the time, I had no idea about that, not being that much into naturalism or studying apes or anything. But it was quite apparent to me that he wasn't inviting me to come over and, like, play pinochle with him or something. <laughs> oh, um, no. That was quite the vicious grin. And it, 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 this whole thing lasted, you know, much shorter than it takes to describe, maybe like a second and a half. Right, sure. From the time he realized I saw him until he gave me the grin. And then my next move was dive on the sled and go as fast as humanly possible <laughs> down the hill. I didn't care if I hit a tree or flew off a super or something. 
it, you know, still better than being caught by whatever the hell that thing was. Right. Oh my God. Um, and, and as I got about down to the midpoint of the hill, uh, my buddy Dave was standing down there and, you know, this was supposed to be a high speed run, but he was still looking concerned. Cause like, dude, you're not dragging your hands or anything. What's going on? <laughs> you barely made it around that last super. He had this look on his face. And then when he saw the look on my face, which, you know, <clears throat> I can only imagine was like, you know, chalky white with bulging eyes. <laughs> He got really concerned when he could see the look on my face, and I didn't even slow down as I went past him. I just yelled, run like hell. <laughs> and apparently he jumped on his sled and was right behind me. But, um, you know, I'm amazed I didn't kill myself going down that sledding hill. We did a really good job of building it, or just the sledding run down would have killed me. <laughs> but as it was, I had so much momentum by the time I hit the bottom of the third hill down to where that frozen quagmire was the momentum carried me all the way across to the Jeez. opposite hillside. And that's like almost the length of a football field. Oh so you God. can imagine how fast I was going. It was retarded. <laughs> when Dave got down to the bottom of the hill, he had to slog about two thirds of the way across because <laughs> he wasn't going nearly as fast as I was. <laughs> that is amazing. Oh, that's crazy. But yeah, the teeth, you know, and, and, you know, yeah, that would definitely, you know, make me a believer uh, that there's something out there and it's sharing the woods with you. And it found your spe- your your hiding spot, you know. <laughs> now that is unusual, though. The 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 sharp teeth. I'd never heard of that before. Before this, yeah. Neither had I. Okay. It took me a long, long, long time to figure, and I'm still not sure I know what's going on with it. Okay. But in uh, the area of northern Minnesota and up into central Canada, eastern Canada, and some of the northern states, Maine, uh, places like that. Um, they almost use the word Wendigo, and mm. that's like the local name for Bigfoot. Okay. And some of them have two names for Bigfoot, which is what put me onto this thing. And especially if you go back to the really, really old reports, um, the Reverend Thomas Guinard in his book, Amongst the Tete du Boulay, described, and this was like in the 1780s, mm-hmm. what did that tribe say the Wendigo was? And their description briefly, and I'm not quoting over word because I don't have it memorized. Sure is that um, it's a giant, hairy savage who goes naked in the woods, is insensitive to temperature variation, and eats Indians. Wow. Wow. Okay. And then if you start looking into more of their legends over there, you find out that they had wars with these damn things. Right. Where, like, you know, it was like, you or us, we're not living in the same territory with you man-eating things, you know? Right, right. Uh, It wasn't friendly, friendly old Bigfoot from the West Coast that, you know, just wants to take your fish out of your trap and, slap the side of your house and leave right. these things are actually like you know predatory going after people and if you if you go and uh, i looked into the legends further north and stuff and uh, also in canada apparently there's these same same sub variety where they have like the regular bigfoot and they also have these other things that are, look kind of like bigfoot but eat people and a lot of the indian tribes will say that too there's two kinds of bigfoot avoid the ones with the red eyes oh make, i've heard that yeah make what you will of that yeah okay um and the other thing is that you know apparently my guess is that it's a subarctic carnivore they're just adapted to ice age conditions um which is why they still live up in you know places like alaska and northern canada and stuff mm-hmm. uh, immense area for them to live in plenty of food as long as you can handle the cold and you're going to eat an almost exclusively meat diet you can do it just fine. That's what the natives do. Sure. Right. Wow. That is just unreal. That's that. I, <clears throat> I thought I'd heard pretty much everything, but now I know that I haven't. That is amazing. So this was well, like, it's even more interesting now is that the Iroquois Confederation, which had like a dozen or more tribes in it, were all throwing the same word around when they were talking about this thing. But part of the Confederation was actually down south that it was, you know, into the United States and, uh, middle United States, sort of. And um, those tribes were also talking about a thing they called a stone giant. Yes. Okay. If you ever heard of the stone giant, the Janosqua, mm-hmm. their, uh, their legend of why they're called the shining ones of the stone giants is because they were covered with stone-like hide. Well, if you look closer at their legends, they explain exactly how they got this stone-like hide. It's not growing on them. It's a, they're a regular Bigfoot-type critter with long hair. And it actually gives a description in more than one of the Indian legends where they're talking about it. The Janosqua would go and rub up against trees until they would have all this uh, pine sap, resin, pitch, and stuff built up on their fur. And then they'd go roll in uh, gravel and crushed rock, which would then adhere to their hide. And after several applications of that, guess what? They got rock armor on them. And your puny little arrows with your little rock uh, broadheads on it aren't going to penetrate anymore. Oh, my God. Yeah. Uh Uh-huh. 
That's yeah, brilliant. bad news, right? right. Now, here, here, let me finish up now. Sure. There's another question. <laughs> because if you take the of what the Janosquid did, there's another tribe that calls this thing the Strendu, and they give the same description of it. And two of the more northern tribes use the word Strendu interchangeably with Wendigo. Oh. So the Wendigo and the Janosqua are the same critter. Ay, ay, ay. Okay. And that's, <laughs> that's all kinds of creepy. Of course, the the Wendigo is, is... No, it's also a possessing spirit, correct? The Wendigo? Yeah, there's like three different weird things going on there. There's the Wendigo psychosis, which is somebody gets cabin fever and, you know, they maybe run out of food or maybe they just go nuts and decide to eat their friends and family. Right. And then, you know, human is more yummier than anything else. Very likely they're just possessed. Right. Uh, definitely could have something to do with it. And there used to be Wendigo hunters in the 1800s that were around the... Uh, running around Canada killing people that were supposedly transforming into Wendigos because huh. they'd get the Wendigo psychosis and start eating their neighbors, and then these <laughs> Wendigo killer specialists would go around and take them down. So there's that thing. And then there's another thing, which is the the supernatural Wendigo spirit, where you think of the, like, uh, the fleshless uh, deer skull with the yes. big antlers on it and the glowing red eyes and this giant spectral entity with claws and blah, 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 eats humans. Um, again, this could be some kind of a demon of the North Woods. It could be the same demon that's causing these people to go insane, possibly possessing them or making them, you know, somehow having a mental connection with them, making them slaves after they eat human flesh. Now you're in my world, sucker. You're working for me sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, there's also a possible connection to skinwalkers. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And then there's another weird thing, which is that more than one researcher that I know has actually either seen and uh, in the case of Jerry Klein's uh, buddies working down there in Ohio, they recently got a game camp picture of a Bigfoot that had like a deer head and part of its hide sitting on top of its head. Are you serious? So, oh my yep. God. So if you got uh, one of these things, you know, uh, running around, it's like, you know, <clears throat> decide it wants to make itself a little hat out of something else. <laughs> you could easily mistake that for, oh my God, there's the Wendigo. You know, it's got this deer antlers on top oh, of wow. its head. It's like eight feet tall. It's got the glowing red eyes. You know, and unless you get closer, in which case you'll never be seen again to report on it, yeah. you'll never be any the wiser about what it is you're actually looking at. Wow. That is all kinds of wild. I haven't that, heard but... any of that. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the portal, Don. <laughs> well, I've heard about, you know, some of the Wendigo stuff, but not, sure. the, not that kind of a connection to Bigfoot. But that's just all crazy. Well, you know, the Wendigo to me is kind of it, it, it's kind of like become... The chupacabra of right. sorts, because yeah. their chupacabra has about five different physical descriptions, and right. people are calling yeah. these chupacabra. Yeah, like the blue tick Texas chupacabra, yeah. and then there's a little reptilian, probably synthetically created weird thing, right. or maybe alien, and yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, so it's like the Wendigo has taken on all these different forms, too, right. and it, it's, I don't know if it's just because... There's like cannibalism involved, or you know, human <laughs> human diet involved. I should say, because I can't say yeah, cannibalism. That's definitely a taboo boys. subject, especially yeah. amongst these northerly tribes, because they had such long winters. That was a real prospect every year mm. that they would have to worry about running out of food, being snowed in, starving to death. You know, so the specter of the Wendigo loomed large on them. But just to give you another story, this one's from Minnesota. There's a place called Wendigo Lake, and I've mentioned this on shows before. Okay. It's up in northern Minnesota. And this is Minnesota is a land of not 10,000, but actually 30,000 lakes. If you fly over it, it's all water with little strips of land in between it. Yeah. <laughs> so there's this one good-sized lake there, and by good size, I mean miles across, that's got a big island on it. And the island's so big, it's got a lake in the middle of it. In the middle of that lake on that island, there's another little island. Oh. Now, apparently, one winter it got cold enough that it froze all the way across the big lake, and the Wendigo was making his way across the lake and ended up being on the island and stuck around too long because there was plenty of game animals over there, and the lake melted, and oh. he was stuck on the island all summer long. As a matter of fact, the people that were over there, they would go to that island out on the lake during the course of the summer, and they said at night they could hear him on the little island in the little lake on the island, wow. howling and screaming and making weird noises. Oh, geez. And it scared the hell out of them, so they didn't want to go out there. And then, like, two years later, it got cold enough, the whole big lake froze over again, and that was the end of the sighting. They wow. never reported any sounds from him. He wasn't there anymore. So it doesn't sound like they swim, then, you know. Just big <laughs> That's big. kind of where I'm going with this. <laughs> right. And I've had a lot of other reports of these northern predatory, you know, 
Arctis uh, Anthropagus uh, Cannibalus, <laughs> Horribilis, whatever you want to call them, uh, you know, that um, there's not one incident I can think of where they go in the water. I've never heard that. As a matter of fact, I've heard things to the contrary, mm -hmm. where people will just stay on the opposite side of a river from where their territory is, and they don't have nothing to worry about. Wow. So it could very well be that these things just literally can't swim. Okay. Uh, don't know how. Might have something to do with their fur uh, or their hair. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, whatever the case is, it seems like they just do not cross water. So, which is great news. During the warmer months, they ain't going anywhere. During the winter, when everything freezes over, then they got free travel routes to wherever they want to go to. Right. And they yeah. seem to like the cold a lot, too. So you generally don't, um, you know, what, uh, there's been like three reports that I know of of this type uh, that happened in the 1970s out of the Minnesota and Dakota area. Okay, dude. And all we're three of them were to... during January, February and cold snaps. Wow. wow. Hold we're, that thought. We're going to go to our first break, ladies and gentlemen. As you can see, it's an epic night here on the portal. <laughs> so don't go away. Get your refreshments. Use the loo, and we'll meet you back here in just a couple minutes.
And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Paranormal Portal. It's our Saturday edition, and we are just having a phenomenal journey so far tonight. And it's just begun. We have just cleared the first half hour. The discussion has been absolutely epic, and that's probably because of our special guest tonight. Uh, Bigfoot World, World Bigfoot Radio's own Duke Sullivan is joining us here on the show, and this guy... <laughs> He's <laughs> already blowing our socks off. Yeah, we're, we're just kind of here rubbing our temples going, oh, wow. wow. <laughs> what else can he tell us? I know. Well, I can't wait to hear. So welcome back, brother, and thank you for being here with us tonight. Hey, it's been a blast, guys. You know, the world is not only stranger than you imagine, it's stranger than you can. <laughs> That's a good point. Stranger than we can imagine. Yeah, absolutely. I was just noticing I was nearly melting a... A cable here in my studio because of my my overzealous use of candles. <laughs> Derp. All right. So not that that has anything to do with the show tonight. Hey, electronic equipment loves hot wax. Come on. <laughs> did you light this? Yeah, you did. Oh, that's why. I don't usually light that one. It's so low. Okay, that explains it. <laughs> All right. So anyway, I thought you watched me do it. <laughs> I, you know, I don't know. All your studio fires averted. <laughs> yeah, I know. There's an extra candle lit that I had right under the cable. Now it explains it. <laughs> All right. So It always happens. Hey, I was in the middle of interviewing uh, a person one time, and my iguana decided to jump on the desk and knock all my equipment over, and that was an epic <laughs> five minutes wasted. Oh, no. Oh. How big is your iguana, by the way? Uh, he he was about three feet long. Oh, big size then. Good size. Yeah, well, yeah, I've had a five-footer before. He three oh, jeez. I used to have a, a boa constrictor. It was I, I really enjoyed having the uh, snakes, and I had a California king and a and a corn snake as well. It was a lot of fun, but they, you know, I don't know. Life just moves on, I guess. Less time for pets now than I yeah. used to have. But well, tonight, ladies and gentlemen, we are discussing uh, Bigfoot and all things cryptid here on the portal. As uh, you know, Duke has a, a world of experience, as you can tell from the first half hour, of not only knowledge and information but experience with a, a plethora of, of amazing things. Um, now, you had mentioned that your first experience was then, but you didn't start investigating until much later. So what was, what was the, the activation for you to begin really investigating and aggressively investigating this? Well, honestly, it was that uh, one of them showed up on our yard oh. in the spring <laughs> about five years later. Oh my and God. at that point, I just went, well... You know, staying out of the woods is not working. So I guess I need to know more about these damn things because they're going to come up on the yard, apparently. Okay. Um, so at that point, I got very interested in digging up all the information that I could. And it's like 77, so, you know, well, yeah. you're talking about like 10 years after the Patterson-Gimlin film. There's like In Search Of, and there's a couple documentaries, and like, you know, three or four people have books out. And that's it. Yeah, there's just nothing out there, and I'm like, well, great, you guys are totally not helping. <laughs> so, I, you know, I had already seen the Patterson Gimlin film, and I, I went like, well, that looks like it's real to me, but it's completely different than what I saw. Mm -hmm. So, there's like two kinds of these damn things running around North America. Apparently, there are. Wow. Uh, you know, because this is as different as looking at a a howler monkey and a orangutan. It's obviously not the same animal. Right. Right. Um, so. Uh, at that point, I got really interested in it, and then uh, much later on the internet, other researchers started talking about there being two kinds down in the south, and I didn't live in the south for more than about you know, six, seven years total, okay. so I didn't have that much time to actually run into more than one kind or you know anything like that. So I have to, t you know, I have to take it from what they're telling me. But other people like uh, Kevin, who was on my show. And had experiences with what we presume to be a type 1 Bigfoot up here in Idaho, where you guys are. Mm -hmm. He's down in Missouri doing research down there, and he spotted a couple of them, and he said that they're not the same thing. This must be what they're calling wood boogers. Uh -huh. So he's, again, convinced that there are two different kinds. And the Bigfoot outlaws are all over this. They'll tell you that there's two different kinds in the, okay. the south. There's the, the wood boogers, and then there's the paddy type, like from over on the Pacific coast. Okay. Which just makes sense, you know. They can, they can sure move. So if they want to move somewhere, they could be all over the place. Yeah, you know, nothing's going to stop them. Right. You know, and we hear that a lot too. That they roam quite a bit. They well, not necessarily migrate, but they just go wherever they want. <laughs> that's that's true. We yeah. That. No, I don't think they really do migrate. I think it kind of depends on the terrain that they're in. And some 
terrain per acre doesn't have that big of a yield of usable food for them. They have to have a wider range. Mm -hmm. In some areas, like over here on the mountain right next to where I'm living, there's a troop that's up there, you know, year round. Oh, the, okay. the mountain's crawling with deer, and there's an elk herd that lives on it. Well, gee, why go anywhere? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, that's probably true. It's like living next to Walmart. Why, yeah. why, why go somewhere else? Yeah, they're else living shopping? in Walmart. You know? <laughs> and the best, of it, best part of it is part of it is uh, the part of it is actually connected to the Lolo National Forest, 2.2 million acres, uh -huh. and another little piece of it is the 35,000 acre recreational area, usable only during the day. Oh, so, okay. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. That works and I found plenty of sign of them in that recreational area. Wow. Well, I can believe that. Yeah. Now, do you suppose these things might have followed you back from that sledding? Because you hear these stories of people saying, look, they will not only, if you see them, they can very well track you over long distances of terrain to see, you know, to see who you are and, you know, follow you home. Do you think that might have happened in your experience? It's a Oh, it's certainly possible. It's kind of odd that it waited like five, five years, years later to yeah. do it, being that I was only three miles from where I saw it. But I, you well, know, do you think I'm that's sure just that that they've been? They probably did it like the very day, but you just didn't get to see them until then because they they are so good at not being um, seen. Yeah, but we were we were cruising around the woods near the house all the time. If anything left tracks around there, we would have found them. Okay. So if they were within visual range of the house, we would have noticed it. Okay, gotcha. Huh. We were snowshoeing and bunny shooting all the time, so we were all over the woods. <laughs> Right. <laughs> That's crazy. Even after that experience, I, you know, you hear so many people are absolutely, I mean, their whole paradigm has changed after a sighting, you know, <laughs> yeah. like that. Oh, never... mine was too. Actually, it was so bad that I actually had hysterical amnesia and forgot that I had seen it. Wow. And oh, really? Dave apparently never saw it. It stayed up on top of the hill. He just saw me panic and go past him. Okay. So he, he didn't know what caused it peculiarly didn't bother to ask me when he got back there. <laughs> yeah that's kind of but it could be that because he was like not in that good of shape and panting me and right <laughs> trying to catch up to me that he was like couldn't breathe enough to ask the question so it just kind of and then years later he asked me and that's it was like two three years later and then it popped back into my memory what had happened i was really mad at him because he made me remember <laughs> and and it, during that time period in the two years in between that i didn't remember it had happened i look back on it after that and went, well, yeah, I kind of really haven't gone very far out in the woods for the last couple of years. And that literally probably not more than a couple hundred yards from the house right. in wow. those two years, even though I didn't like in my conscious mind, remember what had happened. Uh -huh. My subconscious was telling me, apparently you don't go any further. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And, and it's kind of weird that it didn't register on my parents because even after I remembered it, then I didn't want to go in the woods at all. Right. Oh, okay. I, no, 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 no. <laughs> then I'm 12 years old. I remember I had this sighting. I'm not going in the woods at all. And I never brought it up to my parents or anything. And it's kind of bizarre that they never, it's like they didn't even notice it. You know, I go from like practically living in the woods to never setting foot in it. Wow. Yeah. 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 That's a pretty big uh, change in change, behavior. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. for somebody that's like really into hunting and snowshoeing and all that kind of stuff. And I had like 15 plus guns and, you know, like, why wouldn't I be out there shooting? <laughs> Sure. <laughs> uh, you know, never registered, apparently. That just kind of still boggles my mind to this day. Yeah. But then after the one came up on the yard, and this is during the summer, and, and the whole situation is just so weird and counterintuitive, it still doesn't make any sense to me. The more I know about Bigfoot, the less sense it makes. Right. Because there was, like, a huge gathering going on at my folks' house. They had, like, during the entire time I was a kid, like, maybe three gatherings where they had relatives over or something, and they'd have a few beers and turn some music on. And this was like some local function, uh, Lions Club or something or whatever, and they were having something there. So we had a driveway about, you know, 75 yards long, and, and both sides of it all the way down to the road were parked with cars, and there was some out on the road, too. So we had the place was packed. Wow. All kinds of noise. The inside of the house is all lit up. There's a ton of people in there. And, you know, is this an ideal situation to come sneak up on the house? Seriously? <laughs> <laughs> that's a <the> perfect time <laughs> yeah you know and you've got miles of nice quiet woods around you don't need to be anywhere near this house which has a shooting range right behind it wow. and routinely blow away bears that are getting in our garbage bin and whatnot <laughs> yeah that's that's craziness so now you had mentioned two types and now i've heard four types um what's yeah. going on there where's the dis the distinction between the two schools of thought there well, I just, uh, you know, after I got more information, 
situation, uh, what these guys down south were seeing, I adopted, you know, and I think Wes has pretty much adopted the same sort of thing too, if he's got the, if he's still doing the, because he's one of the, the, the guys that mentioned it early on, Bigfoot All has mentioned it early on. Okay. And there's a bunch of people that have this classification system that usually pretty much don't agree with each other on what each oh, thing is. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. High classification system, a type one is your patty type, a type two is your southern wood booger type. A type three is a thing that gets confused for dog man, but doesn't have the uh, the hawks. It doesn't have the reverse looking legs like a dog does with it's trying to stand up on two feet. Sure. It's got that extra joint looking thing. It's actually their ankle, but you know, to us it looks like there's an extra joint there. Right. But uh, you know, they don't have that. They got legs like a Bigfoot or something. The only thing that's not Bigfoot light is they got a short snout on them. Oh, okay. And these are the things that the uh, Micmac Confederation on the Upper East Coast had termed a gugwe. And again, they had uh, several things in their legends about what was actually running around the woods. And this, again, was something that's like didn't seem to conform to a Wendigo. They had Wendigo legends in the same area. Why'd they have a different name for it? Hmm. They also had a regular name for Bigfoot. Wasn't that either. And then I started looking around some of these other tribes, and lo and behold, some of them also had this extra word for so, some kind of a monster thing. And if you got the description, that's what they were describing it. Um, like uh, northern Minnesota and up into uh, Canada from there, the local tribes were calling it a Tugawi, which is very similar to Gugwi, if you'll notice. Yeah, yeah. But like 1,500, 2,000 miles further west. huh? And then, uh, you know, uh, the face eaters and up in uh, central Canada and the law enforcement guys get uh, calls on these things. They call them the bear man. So they've got their own local name that they have for them up there. They, they get calls on them often enough. Blaine Tyler that does research up there in Ontario, he has both kinds in his area. He has the type threes and the regular type one Bigfoot. And he doesn't like the type threes at all. They're way too aggressive. You know, if he goes into an area with his regular Bigfoot, the Bigfoot will just try and get away from him. They'll sneak further back in the woods. They might peek. So he's lucky enough to get a shot of him occasionally, but that's, you know, that's it. These other things will actually like follow you and come toward you when you go in the woods. Oh. And I said, yeah, especially during the winter, they're known to be, you know, like scavengers and they'll eat fresh meat too. And <laughs> they work in groups. So don't give them any chance to get any ideas. Yeah. Um, so yeah, those things are generally more feared than regular Bigfoot, uh, you know, the legends with Bigfoot. If you kind of leave him alone, he'll leave you alone sort of thing. And right. These things are more like uh, having a pack of uh, hungry baboons following you around. You don't know what they're up to. Uh, yeah, none of it's good, I'm sure. <laughs> but, uh, no, they're they're probably thinking that you look yummy and, can they, and they've got enough <laughs> thought process to actually think it out and go, can I get away with nabbing this lone guy? Is there anybody following him? Right. Are we far enough that if I screw up, nobody can hear him scream? <laughs> right. <laughs> And you know, you said you, you mentioned the stone apes. Now that that really shows quite a bit of reasoning and logic. I mean, that's a pretty brilliant move. And uh, you know, you, you wouldn't necessarily attribute that kind of thought process to to these beings, but uh, apparently they they are pretty brilliant, then, huh? Well, in their own way. I mean, right. they don't understand technology or anything like sure. we do because we made that because we need the crutch. They don't. Uh -huh. They've got the physical capability to live without it, including fire. Um, are they smart? Yeah, they're very smart. Can they reason? Can they figure things out? I had plenty of reports of them opening doors, going in houses. Wow. Oh, God. They can figure out how to do all that kind of stuff. It's no big deal. They just don't because it's not good. Because right. if you think about their size, all of a sudden they're in this teeny restricted space. Oh, right. What they don't know what's in there, what potential traps or hazards there are. Sure. Um, you know, so that's why generally you don't have that kind of stuff unless you got some enraged squatch who wants to rip your cabin down because he's mad at you or something. Right. You don't get that kind of thing happening. You know, and generally they'll tear the cabin down when you're not there because uh -huh. they don't want the direct conflict. They don't want to take a chance on getting hurt. Sure. Um, but as far as that goes, yeah, um, it's also interesting to note that even though the name Janosqua is still used in some cases interchangeably with regular old Bigfoot, where apparently some people haven't bothered to do the research. <coughs> <laughs> um, if you go back in time when they got the name of the stone coats and the shining ones and all this stuff with them having this rock like hide, that was during the latter period of when the Indians were running everything, you know, the Native Americans. Sure. And mostly there weren't any colonists in the area. Oh. You had a few French fur trappers, and then after that, you had a few loggers and the voyagers and all those kind of guys, but there was few and far between. When you started getting a general influx of white people, that made uh, flintlock weaponry available to the natives. Sure. 
And what would be the first thing you would do with flintlock weaponry? Because <laughs> you had these neighbors as a problem. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, them. your 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 rock armor isn't going to save you from this, buddy. Oh. We we may be able to ping off little stone tipped arrows off you all day long that won't hurt you, but when you get shot with a sixty nine caliber musket, it's going right <laughs> through your outer rock hide and blowing a hole through your back. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So the, at that point, and so after basically what I'm saying is after that period when that when its colonization started you know, getting robust and there was enough white people around to actually start having connections with the, the local natives and getting in this kind of information from them, there weren't any reports of these guys. Anymore. Right. They they realized the futility of the practice because it was no longer yeah. effective. Yeah. That's brilliant. Which I'm not saying that they don't still do it. It's potentially, I can see several upsides to this in addition to being the like, you know, more impervious to damage thing. Sure. And one being that there's legends that these things like to live in high mountains when available. Um, ab- above the tree line, in rocky talus slopes, in big rock fields. Now, think about it for a minute. Mountain goats got trails that go across this rock field. Mm-hmm. You got rocks all over you, so you look like a pile of rock. Oh, you can sure. lay right next to this trail until one comes walking past and just grab them. Oh, geez. Right. Yeah. Good point. Good point, yeah. Yeah, and the heavy... Another uh, interesting and scary point on this whole subject, before I forget about it, is sure. Dave Pilates, uh-huh. Missing 411. Yep. Mm-hmm. What are the three areas where people most frequently go missing? One is in berry patches, specifically huckleberry being number one. Yep. Two is in swamps, and what's number three? Rocky slopes. The stone fields, yep, the, yep exactly. In fact, they usually, they, if they find people, they, they there's a lot of people that are eventually found, and they're found crushed on those stone slopes or whatever. Like they'd been lopped down. Yep. yep. Yeah, we had one of those here a few years ago in the Bitterroot Valley. Uh, one of the locals, um, according to the police, had fallen to his death while trying to free climb. And uh, we didn't buy that. I got a hold of Kelly Shaw. He came out here and actually did an investigation on it and talked to the next of kin. And they said that every regard, the newspaper uh, press release issued by the police was completely false. Oh, wow. Uh, this kid had lived here all of his life. He was a hiker and a runner. He never did any free climbing. He wouldn't think about free climbing by himself for the first time. That's just insane. He knew better. Um, he didn't have any free climbing equipment that he left in his car, like the cops claimed. He didn't have any free climbing equipment. Oh, geez. So it was just a convenient press release to... Yeah. It's like, oh, uh, he fell to his death. Yeah. That's why he was mangled at the base of this big rocky slope. Yeah. Oh, that's terrible. And two days later, another guy went missing, and they didn't find him. This was four miles away from him. And they didn't find this guy's remains for almost two weeks. And they were out there with helicopters. They had rescue dog teams. They had all the local, you know, sheriffs, detectives, all those guys out there looking for him. They couldn't find him. His truck was there, door open, no guy there. Dogs can't find a blood trail. So, like, what? If a predator would have killed them, there would have been some evidence of it. Sure. It would have had to pick them up. Then they would have found the predator smell, and there would have been a trail. Nothing. No evidence. Two weeks later, corpse-finding dogs find his remains two miles away on an extremely steep wooded slope, torn into pieces. Oh, my God. Ugh. Yeah, that's freaky. That's freaky, freaky stuff. You know, and that, that I guess what that, that does to me is, you know, some people like to consider that that you know these are just the simple forest dwellers and and they're peaceful but like you're saying there's several different types and some of them uh, were on the menu yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah and the other thing is that you can't really throw blanket statements over any of them in general the type ones are the least aggressive that doesn't mean you couldn't get mashed by one right, right. you're in the wrong place at the wrong time you do something dumb you panic you shoot them before you think about it oh god you're in trouble now right you know? yeah Pray he decides to run away and doesn't just attack. Like the bone. Or, you know, you're like too close to where there's a mama and some squatchlets and daddy comes up on it and goes, oh, I'm just going to throw a log at him. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. Or a boulder. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We just covered a story uh, last night. It was I think it was out of the 20s or 30s of this rodeo hand who went up north with a couple other the native rodeo hands. They were hunting for their winter meat, and they ended up camping in this place uh, way out in the woods and in the sticks. And uh, they were in British Columbia. And the guy w- said that there were basketball and beach ball-sized boulders that were thrown over a 50-foot creek and accurately hitting their tents and stuff. And the, the, the strength is just unbelievable. 
So clearly that tells you there was a last vestige of the Roman legionnaires that got hopelessly lost and the artillerists still there were using their catapult skills, getting a little practice in while they had the opportunity. Yeah. Or it could be boulder grizzlies, maybe a boulder grizzly. Boulder no. grizzlies. Seriously, come on, you guys. Yeah, yeah it sounds legit, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, actually, that's I like to make fun of that because some of the stuff that – the you know people that aren't paying attention jump to to rationalize these uh, you know mental leaps that protect their little world from collapsing like a, a house of cards That's are just so much more far fetched than the possibility that hey maybe Bigfoot did that yeah. that it's just hilarious right it is and, and you're right you're absolutely right and then the the lengths that they go to to throw normal uh, normal uh, events and put them in some kind of ridiculous chain in order to make it seem like it, it's perhaps plausible, it's just ridiculous. I mean, it's just easier to go, hey, there's something out here that can throw rocks, and we don't know what it is, but it's out here. I mean, that's, <laughs> you know, but you're right. There's just these other ideas, are, and it just goes to the point yeah. of ridiculousness to protect, protect a paradigm. But um, yeah. I don't know. It just it just. Well, there's some out. areas that I've heard of, like over on the other side of the Bitterroots from here, you know, anybody that's driving around with four-wheel ATVs or, Motor, uh, mountain, you know, mountain bikes or any of that. Well, the motorized ones seem to really attract their attention, but they get rocks thrown at them. Right. Oh. But they kill, They keep doing it. <laughs> it's like, you know, let's run the gauntlet. I don't know what's throwing those rocks at us, but they've missed so far. Go fast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I, well, I think, I, I personally think that they must use rocks as a hunting technique and and I, I think i've heard other researchers say this but i actually had the idea on my own and then i found out that other researchers were saying the same thing um do you do you subscribe to that the idea that they are actually very very precise rock throwers <laughs> yeah it doesn't take all that much practice to get good at it what else have they got to throw logs <laughs> or rocks man they're going to get good at both of them right yeah uh yeah, you know, we've got video of Bigfoot hucking like a 12-foot tree. Thinker Thunker did a breakdown on that. Yep. We've got other, you know, stuff that indicates that they do throw logs, they do throw rocks. So that's pretty much, you know, <clears throat> more or less case closed on that one in the, in the Bigfoot community. So, yeah, you know, definitely. Um, let me give you an example. When I was uh, a kid, like I said, I had a lot of guns and stuff. That was during the, the bicentennial, 1976. Mm -hmm. And I was uh, a part of a black powder gun club. So we'd go do the marches and parades where we'd all have our buckskins and all that kind of stuff. And we had the black powder shoots. And one of the things that we did was tomahawk and knife throwing competition, which I really got into. Mm -hmm. And I won a bunch of trophies at it. Oh, cool. And so later on, 1980, me and my cousin were out in the Bighorn Mountains in uh, Wyoming and ran out of food because we were stupid. <laughs> and we didn't have any other way to go gather anything with us except for to take a buck knife and tie it onto a stick and try and make a spear out of it. Mm -hmm. So we just we saw a herd of turkeys and we decided to chase them around. <laughs> and, yeah, that that didn't work out very well. They could stay ahead of us uh, until they got up to the bald top of this mountain and they started following this uh, trail that sort of stayed at the same level. It didn't go up or down. And we got about like a third of the way around the mountain. My cousin goes, I bet this thing goes all the way around the mountain. And I went, yeah, I bet you're right. And he said, go back and sit next to a good spot. I, I'll just keep going and I'll chase him right around to you. And I'm like, okay. So I found this spot on the trail where a big log had fallen over it. And the turkeys are more than likely going to crawl under, you know, duck their head and go under the log. Um, and sure enough, the first one came, ducked his head, went underneath the log. I had found a nice split, flat-looking rock. It was, like, perfectly flat on one side, and sort of, like, uh, you know, discus-shaped on the other side, uh -huh. about six inches across. And I winged that sucker right when his head came up. I caught his neck between the rock and the log and took his head off. Wow. So well, once he got done crappie flopping, we had turkey that we had to cook at high altitude that took really way too long. <laughs> but the, uh, the point here being that even I, an idiotic human born in the 20th century, can do something like that with a rock. Of course, Bigfoot can do it. Right. Yeah, I agree. And, and I think that, you know, they, they seem to also, uh, you know, have pretty, pretty uh, uh, efficient hunting. I mean, wolves do the same thing, so it's not a big stretch. But, you know, as far as having the pushers and the ambushers and stuff like that, you hear about that uh, quite a bit in the field, too. And that makes sense. I mean, that, that stands to reason that they hunt mm -hmm. in, in a pack type of thing. But, uh, um, yeah, it's just it's amazing 
the the amount of adaptation and uh, how prolific they are. I mean, this is there are reports of them moving uh, incredibly fast. The fastest I've heard of, and you'll have to tell me if, if this is the same that you've heard, but I've heard of like forty five miles an hour. Wow. Yeah, I've had two different uh, people on my show that both had incidents where their vehicle was being chased out. It wasn't content with it, just jumping in it and peeling out. It decided to make the point and chase them. And both of them reported that they weren't able to lose it until they hit about 50 miles an hour. Then they started gaining on it. Right. Oh, my God. You know, I think Cindy mentioned that before, too. Out here, she was, uh, you know, because she, a couple of times she was out here uh, in, in our area looking out. Um, she said that she was chased out with rocks. Um, they were throwing rocks at her. But I do believe she said that they, they kind of stayed up with her. She felt that they stayed up with her when she was doing like 35 close to 40 down the road so wow break time there's the break ladies and gentlemen well, this is one hour down we got an hour to go and you can tell it's in just an epic night so stick around we'll be right back everybody hey sick time
are usually associated with an individual. Hauntings seem to be connected with an area. A house, usually. The guy's disturbance is of fairly short duration, perhaps a couple of months. Hauntings can go on for years. And so can that intro, ladies and gentlemen. It can go on for years. But it's a classic movie. We just always pay homage to it on the Paranormal Portal. It's one of my personal favorites. But welcome back to the show. We are heading into hour number two here with uh, myself and Mr. Don. That'd be me. That is you. And As you're, always. Yep, good. I remember to unmute yeah, you this time. Yeah. Sweet. <laughs> so that's good. And tonight, ladies and gentlemen, we are joined by our special guest, World Bigfoot Radio's own Duke Sullivan is here with us. Duke, how you doing? Doing good. Don't hug the Wookiee, guys. <laughs> well, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Don, you're going without tonight. <laughs> ah, dog on it. No sweet, sweet loving for me. Don's getting no love tonight. He's my own personal Wookiee. Yeah, hey, hey, hey. <laughs> he's, he's the Chewbacca to my hand solo. Yeah. More like ham sandwich. <laughs> Ooh, nice. Just getting a dig. Uh, welcome. Yeah, to- when you see those online ads, don't be lonely, call Squatch only. No, those are traps. Don't don't do it. <laughs> I need loving too, Duke. Bait, bait needed. <laughs> yeah, I saw that bait needed one that's going around. Yeah, somebody's doing research and that's got an ad out for bait needed. <laughs> Must enjoy camping. <laughs> so welcome back to the show. And uh, we've covered, you know, a little bit of ground, but I can tell that we're not even going to touch this in two hours. Mm-mm. We're not even going to get to, uh, you know, everything that you could tell us. So that just means you're going to have to keep coming back. You know that, right? Okay. <laughs> I guess. All right. Well, I'm glad you're agreeable. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> so we were talking about, um, about the, the different types, one and two. Um, now, one thing that I found was interesting, and you were talking about that even in the South, they have the wood burgers and the wood burgers and then type ones. Now I've always heard that the ones in the south are are generally much more aggressive than the ones in the north. Have you heard anything about that or have any opinion on that? I think it's generally because they seem to have more type twos down there, and type twos seem like they're they're more aggressive. They uh, they'll cause more general problems for humans. They're more vocal for sure. It seems like they like to make vocalizations quite a bit more than the type ones do. Okay. Yeah, I've been in, I've been in areas before where there's like ton of Bigfoot sign around. You never hear a peep out of them, other than mimicking maybe another animal. That's it. They don't howl or anything like that. So, so um, you know, I think that's more. You got to be if it's type ones, you got to kind of be out in the middle of nowhere. You're probably not going to hear much in the way of vocalizations or something. Type twos will go off if they're down the block from you. <laughs> <laughs> Do you suppose that, that that's just a more territorial type of display then, since they are more yeah, aggressive? I could, it could be that they're, you know, they're more more clannish territorial. I mean, from what the boys down south tell me, it sounds like they don't interbreed between type ones and twos. Really? Okay. And they probably have, you know, different territories that they don't allow each other onto. I know the researchers up in uh, Alaska that I know, uh, one of them was actually living in an area that was on a borderline uh, between the apparently two, two territories of two different varieties. And... Uh, the ones didn't seem, the ones on the one side of the house seemed like they didn't mind them being there too much. The other ones were trying to kill them and get them out of there. Oh, God. Uh, so, yeah, but they ended up winning. They had military stockpiles. Let's just leave it at that. Oh. So, <laughs> yeah, that'll do it. <laughs> that's, that's yeah. a, that levels the playing field a little bit there. <laughs> 
Yeah, it doesn't matter what type you're talking about. They don't like explosives. So that tends to make them not want to hang around very much after that. Wow. You know, um, Duke, we hear a lot about, you know, the horror stories and things like that. Um, what is it? Brown Brown Creek? Brown Springs? Brown Springs, oh, Brown Springs down All there right. in Texas. And, yeah. you know, we hear about a lot of, you know, some, well, we hear of some, uh, you know, horror stories, you know. And do you think be with with these horror stories that we hear, you know, um, what was the other one um, in Oklahoma, Hanoba, Hanobia, Hanobia, Hanobia. Yeah. yeah. You yeah. know, so do you think that uh, there might be an eradication plan in place if the say, you know, hypothetically the government knew? Yeah, hypothetically. <laughs> uh, yeah, any of them that become too much of a problem are, are disposed of. Mm -hmm. there's, there's no doubt in my mind about that because they, they simply would have to. If people started going missing in one area too much and right. they couldn't you know, blow it off on cultists or something, they'd have to get rid of the problem okay. before it became too obvious. Right. But the other thing you guys should consider is that an even worse problem from their standpoint is ones that are overly friendly and will let you get pictures of them. Uh -huh. mm, sure. There you go. That's true too. That if they want to keep it quiet, and they and it clearly clearly seems like they do, that they don't want this evidence out there. They don't want the, that validation out there. Nope. Yeah, and and sadly, the uh, the ones that would be more um, interested in actually having something to do with humans would be like even more of a problem for them than the ones that just want to throw a log at us or something. Right. Mm hmm. Hmm. That's really, really interesting. Do you really think, do you think that there's a lot of, um, I don't know, would that, okay, let's ask this. Would that be an individual trait or would that be like a, a clan or a tribe trait? Um, either they're aggressive or they're, you know, um, uh, friendly. Well, there's two things that you have to look at in a situation like that. According to what we've been able to figure out, they have a structure in their groups that are similar to like what gorillas or something have. Mm -hmm. um, so there's going to be an alpha male that's going to be running the show. And it really depends on his attitude. Mm -hmm. If he wants to let the other members of the troop interact with humans, they go mess with humans. They slap your house. Mm -hmm. you know, they, they, they throw your tools on the roof of your house and you can't find <laughs> them, stuff like that. Right. He doesn't care. Ha ha, that's funny. <laughs> other ones are like, no, you know, they don't want any of the members of the troop to have anything to do with humans. And they're probably hostile toward us. Like maybe when he was a... Uh, a beta male, he got too close to a deer hunter and got shot or something, so now he hates all humans and no, you're not allowed to go near him now that I'm the alpha. So some of that you can probably figure would have something to do with whatever the leadership of the local group was going to be. And the other thing is, as smart as they obviously are, they're going to be individuals and they're all going to have different likes and dislikes and different temperaments. And some of them are going to be short-tempered creeps. Right. Just like humans, you know, most humans are pretty agreeable. You can get along with them for the most part. And then there's like Ed Gein or, you know, some <laughs> yeah. of these. Yeah. You don't want to be around these people. They're problems. <clears throat> right. Um, so no doubt they have analogs like that. You know, and if, the, if a Bigfoot like that becomes too much of a problem, what do they do with them? Do they kill them mm -hmm. or do they just throw them out of the troop? Well, then it's a rogue running around. Right. That's got mental issues and God knows what they're going to do. Mm. So it's like really hard to draw blanket statements about any of these varieties I just like, you know, the way I've got them categorized, the further up the scale goes and the higher number gets, the less you can um, rely on them not wanting to attack you, let's just say. Hmm. Okay, okay. So you mean by scale, by by size? or, or uh, No, by type. Okay. Type 1s are tend to be the least dangerous. Type 4s <clears throat> are the most dangerous. Okay, gotcha. And there's not a lot of type 4 reports, and the reason for that is because, first of all, there's not very many of them. They're subarctic, thank God. Mm -hmm. um, so mostly where they are, humans aren't, vice versa. But um, in those occasions over the last two, three hundred years where people have had encounters with these things, usually the only person that's reporting the encounter is a survivor. The main person that had the run-in with the Wendigo got killed. Mm -hmm. yeah. And somebody that was there saw it happen and, and survived to talk about it. But some of these lone hunters and stuff out there by themselves walking through these you know, trackless frozen wastelands you know, mile after mile after mile after mile of frozen forest that all looks the same. Uh, you know, you get in a situation like that and you pick up one of these things. Well, <laughs> what's going to persuade him that you're not food? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, right. <laughs> exactly. Um, <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you think that, that perhaps a lot of the missing 411 stuff could be these cryptids mm. then, right? 
Um, I've done shows about this before, and I tend to lean away from trying to blame regular old type one patty type Bigfoot for sure. any of this stuff, really. I'm sure there's definitely aggressive <clears throat> ones that attack people. There's aggressive ones that have killed people. Yeah. Um, is it common? No. I, uh, I don't think that they're cannibalistic in as much as they're opportunistic. Right. If it was starving to death and you wandered too close to his cave in February or something like that. Eh. Maybe it'd start looking like a chicken delight truck rolling up with the, <laughs> with the siren swinging, you know, from their standpoint. But, uh, you know, there's other ones that'll just, like, go out of their way to go after people. Uh, the Wendigo type has an especially bad reputation for that, um, which, again, goes back to some of the adrenochrome harvesting and the aliens and that sort of thing. And that um, if you've ever had a cut of meat from a slaughterhouse where they didn't, like, kill their animals without them knowing it was happening their body will get pumped full of adrenaline. The meat will actually taste different. Oh, okay. And it seems like um, from some of the encounters, I mean, one of the reports we had, this guy was actually trailed by a Wendigo for a week. Oh, he geez. was out there by himself, and it kept, it would howl off in the distance occasionally to scare him. And then after dark, it would get close up to camp and let him see it, but not enough that he could get a shot at it and scare him. And so he was just in a constant state of terror for the better part of a week. Well, imagine how pumped full of adrenaline is. Oh, no doubt. Yeah, that's true. And then shortly before, he was just going to go completely nuts and you know run out of energy and just die. And this thing kept getting closer and closer all the time. He just lucked into running into a lumber camp. Oh, wow. And, <laughs> and they saved his butt because then Wendigo wasn't going to come in and take out all these lumbermen. But apparently that night it sat outside the camp and did a bunch of howls and stuff, too, to wow. terrify the lumbermen and let them know it wasn't particularly happy about wasting a week chasing this guy. It was, and, it, it, you know, for as far as this guy apparently walked, if this thing had a territory, he was out of it. Oh, yeah. It was following him beyond it and just terrorizing him, probably with the intention of eating him. Wow. Wow, that is amazing. <laughs> That, that's just terrifying. I mean, just to think that we could be on a menu is just horrible. And, and granted, it's not exclusive to these, these beings alone. I mean, a, a rogue bear, a rogue mountain lion, and, you know, but it's just, God, these things are smart, too. And that's what's really creepy about it. It's like they, they reason to a point and they, you know, they have, uh, you know, intelligence and, and still. Yeah, like, that, was, that was part of the terror with the... Uh... Uh, the Genosqua, you know, because they would have groups of those things that were fighting with the natives. And, the, you know, from the native standpoint, they called them cannibals because they thought of them as being like people. Right, they right. humans, but they're people. Yep. Um, so they're eating other people, whether they're, you know. Sure. They're not humans, but they are people. They eat people, therefore they're cannibals, basically. Uh -huh. um, but the point here is that, you know, these, they're just as smart as people are in some regards, and so they've got that capacity to be stealthy and to track you. They know what tracks are. Mm -hmm. They can smell you. Their hearing is way better. They're way faster. Mm -hmm. They can travel through the treetops when the trees are big enough, not leave a track on the ground. They can do all sorts of things that you wouldn't think about or expect and plop, they're right in front of you, falling out of a tree. Oh, God, you're dead. Splat, your head goes off. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love the matter-of-fact, just brutality of it. <laughs> Smack, you're gone. That's, your head's gone. That's, that's all. But, you know, it, and, that's, and that's the scary, that's the really, that really is the scary thing. It is. Know, so. Yeah, I uh, don't know. I mean, this is, this is pretty deep, and, and it's, uh, I don't know what to say. I mean, of course, they're not all dangerous, like you say, but I mean, it is, it is still, if anything, it just reminds us that there's so much more out there. And now I know that you, you know, you do talk Bigfoot a whole bunch, and I don't want you to feel like that's the only thing we're interested in, because as I understand it, you've got a lot of different experiences, and I'd love to hear a bunch of those. Okay. Well, um, <laughs> you know, it's, I could say that as far as um, actual physical evidence of cryptids other than Bigfoot, um, one of the things that I found, I was up in uh, the local ghost town of Coloma, which apparently the Bigfoot really like hanging out there during the summer because all the locals are terrified of it and won't camp there. Oh. Uh, and I found that out by camping there in 2015 and coming back in 2018 and noticing that nothing had changed. No, oh. None of the local fire pits had been used, nothing. Oh, wow. So uh, nobody's camping there in like three years until I come back. <laughs> the time previously I was there, one of them came up and shook my tent and then slapped the side of the SUV as he ran away. <laughs> so anyway, so we know they're there. They're up there. Um, the local legend is that this mining town, a whole bunch of bad things happened, starting out with really bad placement. 
Um, that being that there was a native burial ground right next to it. Mm. And they decided to build the mining town there. Um, and, and other bad things apparently happened. Long story, won't go into that. But it got uh, deserted before they had ever even put in electricity or anything. So this is early 20th century. They were all out of there. Mine has played out, whatever. Now, Garnett, one of the best-known ghost towns, the best-kept-up ones that you can visit over here in Montana, is, interestingly enough, on the top of the very same mountain, about four miles from it. Oh. And this is like one of the most visited ghost towns in the West. And lots of people have been there, and none of them there know that four miles away is creepy Coloma with a lot more buildings and old abandoned mine and infested with Bigfoot. So the other thing is that there's legends all over this area about there being little people there. Now, whether that has anything to do with them abandoning the mine or anything, I have no idea. I haven't found any connection to that. But I was told to be careful in the area that there are little people there, too. And at that point, I was just like, okay, yeah, another legendary thing. I haven't seen one yet. Mm -hmm. Not inclined to believe it until I see evidence, but I'll keep it in the back of my mind. That's just kind of how I deal with this stuff. Sure. Uh, I found that they had actually made a ramp from the top of the mountain. And one side of it's basically a cliff, a few hundred feet high. And they had literally carved a ramp on the side of this thing wide enough for a wagon to go down. Huh. So they could take whatever it was they were taking down there. And it looked like uh, down at the base of it, it was mostly like the stuff they had dug out of the mine, just tailings or whatever, you know, slag heaps. And they were hauling them down there and dumping them. So you got this whole rolling terrain with these little mounds about eight feet high mm -hmm. and, you know, pits maybe six feet deep in between them and, like, you know, practically right next to each other. So you could be literally surrounded by something a human size. There could be 20 of them within 50 feet of you and you wouldn't see them. Oh. So that made me creeped out to start with. <laughs> and this had been, you know, long enough ago that there was trees and everything growing up on it. In fact, there was like very little of the original rock or dirt or anything showing anymore. And I had pretty much decided that, well, this is about as far as I want to go by myself. My research person that I'm out here with is still up on top of the mountain in the ghost town. Doesn't really know where I wandered off to, so probably shouldn't go any further. And I went to light up a cig, and I looked down in front of me. In front of me, there was a little bare patch of ground on the top of this little mound that was about maybe three, four feet long and about two, three feet wide. Just a, a one little random spot that hadn't grown in with grass or moss or anything. And going across it were three little tracks that looked like a toddler's footprints, except they were wearing moccasins. Huh. Oh, my God. And I went, okay, there's no way in hell any woman was down here with her toddler with moccasins letting them run around. I'm getting the hell out of here. <laughs> and I swiftly turned around and went back to the top of the, of the, uh, the cliff where the, the ghost town is. Um, so for me, that was like, yep, they said there's little people around here. I found tracks. That looks like little person tracks. They, they're wearing moccasins, too, yet. <laughs> okay, I'm starting to believe there's little people around here. And then uh, after we were out there in Coloma last time, last fall, Michael um, decided to go back out there the following weekend and ran around the top of the mountain a little bit more, just did road squatching, looking for structures he could see, and found himself a gigantic axe that he could see from the road, went over, and we took a few pictures of it, and got this eerie feeling that something was watching him and didn't want him being there. So oh. discretion being the better part of valor and suicide, he decided <laughs> that he would leave forthwith. Turned around, started going back toward the car, and then kind of thought, well, as long as I'm on my way back to the car, I'll just, you know, watch the ground on the way back, see if I spot anything. And sure enough, they're kind of old and, you know, uh, probably been rained on a couple times, so the detail on them isn't that great. But he found a couple gigantic tracks, probably 22 inches long. Oh, my you know, God, that's uh, huge. At least. He's got a picture of his foot next to him. Um, so, yeah. And uh, <laughs> it looks, it's hard to tell because they're so old and they're so worn out. But after multiple looks at them um, and, and changing the color and stuff to bring up shadow and whatnot, mm -hmm. it really looks like they're four-toed. Oh. So if that's actually what they are, it's like he found a mountain giant track. Wow. And this is still like about two miles from Coloma, where a different person actually had photographed mountain giant tracks in 2014 when he was up there camping. A much smaller individual. So um, creepy. Yeah. And that gets to be a little a little tough, except for the four toe thing. But to draw the distinction between what would be a Sasquatch track and what would be a mountain giant track, um, if it was at all obscured, you you really wouldn't know then, would you? Because they're all in no. the same range. Yeah. If you, uh, it seems like that they like the, the mountain giants stay exclusively up in the mountains, and they're so huge they have giant areas. So you don't hardly ever run into them. If you, one of them could have an area with like, you know, just guessing here, but it could be like six or eight different Bigfoot troops 
in what he considers his territory. Wow. Because they need so much range and so much food to feed them. But uh, what we've been able to find out from uh, mythology and legend, which, by the way, is mostly coming from over in Norway and Sweden, uh-huh. where they had things called mountain trolls and trolls. Yeah. And the description seems to match really, really well. Okay. So, in fact, a mountain giant may actually be a type of troll. And um, these things are attributed with being able to sleep for vast periods of time. They can hibernate just like a bear. Okay. So you wouldn't necessarily ever see a track one of them during the winter unless they had some reason to go from point A to point B. They might just take a nap the entire winter. Wow. Okay. Well, that's that's interesting. Very, very interesting. And that explains a lot because I, I often wondered about that. I think that that subject is absolutely fascinating, but there again, the, there's such a shortage of physical evidence. Um, you just don't hear of that stuff very often at all. And and so I, I would I would assume then that the numbers of those are, are quite a bit less than like, say, for instance, a Sasquatch then, right? Very small. And apparently, according, again, according to um insider information and also from legends they live hundreds of years so they don't have to like meet up with uh, mama troll and make a baby very often if you know what i mean oh right right so they don't have to do much to keep the population rolling just stay alive no no yeah they they go you know go find a female when they're like 250 or something oh jeez <laughs> never see her again Angel. no alimony <laughs> old enough to date <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if she's going to show up knocking on the cave door with a whole troop of angry Bigfoot <laughs> looking for Alan. I don't think it's happening. Yeah, exactly. You said you were going to get cigarettes. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, yeah, seriously, one of the people that uh, that helped me a lot with the research on this end of things as far as these critters are was uh, uh, Solveig Fulkerheim over in Sweden who runs a channel called Crypto Sweden. Oh, cool. And she does uh, not only field research, believe it or not, there's four or five Bigfoot researchers on the ground, boots on the ground, in Norway and Sweden. And they're finding the same things we are. Uh, but she's also doing the archive work because she can read some of the old variants of Norse and Sweden. She's been looking at that stuff, too. Huh. And what she found out was very interesting is that they're listing as separate individual uh, beings three different things. First of all is, of course, giants. Okay. There's the frost giants and the fire giants and blah, blah. Norse mythology, Swedish mythology, yeah, giants, just like everywhere else in Europe. Mm -hmm. The second thing, interestingly, is the forest people. Okay. Now, the description of the forest people sounds exactly like Bigfoot. And then the third thing, and you got to be careful of this because it gets confused, in Sweden, everything is a troll. Um, Trolldom literally means witchcraft. So little people are trolls, trolls are trolls, Bigfoot's trolls, anything that's like supernatural, weird, out of the ordinary, it's a troll. In Norway, a troll means troll. There's only two kinds. There's little short ones that are about four feet tall, and there's ginormous ones like what we're talking about. Okay. So this is this is what we're actually talking about, and this is what, the way she did the search. So first of all, she found out the giants, and then she found out the forest people, and she went, yes, there's a different thing that's not either of those two that's a troll. Mm. Wow. And, that, and that's really neat, though. And I've always liked to believe that, you know, to every legend there's some truth. I mean, it comes from somewhere. And all that lore and folklore and stuff is based upon something. So I, I think that's phenomenal. I mean, it is for me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that's really cool. And so the other part of it is that's, that's really bizarre is like how diverse it is. And when you go around the globe, these different regions have these same descriptions, you know, and, and it's, it's truly a global phenomenon. This isn't just a U.S. thing or, or North American thing. It's, it's everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. The one uh, the one thing that you can say that pretty much globally, there's th- other than dragon legends, there's three kinds of cryptids that you're going to find everywhere. Uh-huh. One of them is something like a Bigfoot. One of them is a giant. And the other one is some kind of little person. Right. Right. You find them everywhere. Yeah. It's just amazing. Absolutely amazing. We're almost to our last break of the night. And, uh, you know, clearly, ladies and gentlemen, this is a, an epic discussion. And <laughs> I think I'm, I'm most blown away by your, your ability to recall all these facts. And no things. kidding. I'm just like, wow, I have a hard time remembering my neighbor's name. And, <laughs> <laughs> and here you are like, oh, yeah, back in this time in 19, blah, blah, blah. It's a wow. So, I mean. Uh, it, it, I was a lot better before I, did, I uh, banned my dramage. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I understand that. Yep, I, uh, <laughs> yeah, we're we're all a little bane damaged here. 
I think some of us more than others, but uh, clearly you've kept most of your faculties. Um, it's just a dyslexia of mine remembering names. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, generally I'm really bad with dates. I can kind of remember places and names, but dates are what usually throws me. Uh, and, and now for, well, I mean, we got like a minute left, so I, I probably shouldn't ask you any more questions until then. But I do want to get in on the other side some of your other uh, non-cryptid uh, encounters that we, we touched on just a little bit before the show. But it's absolutely fascinating, and I hope you'll, you'll indulge us that as well. Um, but ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is just a, an epic night. I'm just, my head's kind of reeling, and I, I got this humming between my ears, but it's a happy feeling. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy. It's that, oh, no, I have to go back and listen to this one over again. <laughs> oh, I'll, be, I'll be putting this one on repeat for a while, I'm sure. But, but fascinating, absolutely fascinating information. So uh, we're going to head to our last break, ladies and gentlemen. We'll be just a couple minutes, and we'll be back at it with our guest, Mr. Duke Sullivan, here on the Paranormal Portal. So don't go away.
and welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the last half hour of our journey tonight. Um, if you want to call in, we've got the call-in board, of course, is available, but I, I, I have to admit I've been kind of reluctant to check it or just forgetful to check it because I'm falling into the trap of actually listening to tonight's, <laughs> tonight's guest a whole lot and forgetting that I'm doing a show. <laughs> But our special guest tonight, ladies and gentlemen, is Mr. Duke Sullivan of World Bigfoot Radio. And thank you again for being here with us tonight, Duke. It's just been an absolute uh, knowledge fest and fun. And, you know, you, <laughs> you got the whole the whole buffet for us tonight. That's just excellent. Well, I'm glad to be here, you guys. It's a hoot for me, too. It's really fun. And I'd like to say hi to some people in chat right now, Kevin from Glagland and Amanda and Patsy and of my regular friends over on my uh, group. Hey, guys, glad you could make it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and welcome out to all our new listeners. Uh, and don't forget to subscribe, comment, and share. <laughs> <laughs> Got to get it in there. Well, 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 that's good. Yeah, absolutely. And we're really thrilled to meet all you new guys, new, new viewers and stuff. Thank you so much for coming and checking out the episode. Even if you're just here for Duke, it's an honor for us to have you. And we hope you're enjoying the experience. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I know I am. And before before the break, I, I mentioned uh, that you and I had talked a little bit prior to the show about some other oddities that you've encountered. And I'm kind of dying to hear more of those. Well, one of them that I brought up before the show that we were talking about is probably the single weirdest thing that I've ever experienced and uh, totally not Bigfoot related. I was in the middle of town here in Missoula. It was during the summer, and it was like mid-afternoon. And I was crossing an intersection. It was a uh, four-way. There was a good-sized road going off to my left-hand side. And then crossing it at right angle, there was a smaller um, local street. Well, on the side of the road that I was on, that local street was actually blocked off. They were doing road construction on it. And across from it was the parking lot for a grocery store. So... I was kind of like, well, why am I waiting for the signal to go across the street? It's like, <laughs> you can't drive down the street, right? I'm just going to go slowly pedal my bike across. And I got about halfway across the street, and all of a sudden, something hit the uh, right-hand side of my front tire of my bike. And it felt almost like, uh, you know, a human jogger had run into me or something. Wow. And the tire <laughs> jumped about a foot to the left, and I managed to stay on the bike. It, it, there was nothing there. There was nothing there. So there was something there, but it just wasn't visible. <laughs> well, it had a physical impact on the bike, and it felt like a physical thing ran into the bike, but there was nothing visible to see. Hmm. And, you know, this wasn't like middle of the night out by a haunted house or something. This is right in the middle of town in the middle of the day. Right. Uh, I got my bike across the, the over to the other sidewalk and just kind of sat there for a minute and went, what the hell just happened? Right. Right. That is bizarre. Um well, and no, I mean, that was just the impact. And then the, the other than other than that, you had no other indicator that something was there. There was no nothing else. Just an impact. nothing. No sound. No, uh, no uh, footsteps. No nothing. Wow. That is so bizarre. Well, you know, Montana, especially Missoula, Missoula's got some haunted history over there. Oh, I can believe that. Actually, the local natives wouldn't even live in this valley. We thought it was creepy and spooky, and there was something wrong with it. Right, yeah. I've heard the same thing about this place where we live, actually, that the, <laughs> that the native uh, tribes called it, like, the damp death or something like that, that there was, or wet death or something like that. It was just like they didn't stay here during many seasons of the year just because, uh, you know, I guess it just wasn't considered very healthy here for some reason, and maybe... Maybe it has a lot to do with that. I don't know. But I know this whole region up here is is got, you know, for, for you know, I'm, I'm going to sound a little uh, maybe snowflakey, but I think it just has a, a real incredible energy. And it's hard to explain, but there there's like a natural vibration here that's just really powerful and, and really potent. And so it wouldn't surprise me at all. That that is it. It is a sort of beacon, and perhaps it's ley lines. I don't know. I've never looked into the ley line configuration around here. But with you know, you you're over in Montana. You're pretty close to the you know the the Yellowstone mega caldera, and of course around those natural natural occurring uh, um, what do I want to say uh, energy uh, sources like that are, are often beacons for a lot of different activity and perhaps portals and stuff like that. I mean. You know, this is kind of what we go into on the show here, but uh, it wouldn't surprise me at all, you know, if there was just a whole lot of spiritual activity around 
this entire region. Well, and that was attributed to it before the white man ever moved in here. So why would it be any different now? Sure. You know, another thing that people don't think about is the, uh, and a lot of people don't even know about, um, you know, there's actually giant megaliths right here in Montana. And you think about megaliths being, you know, like Stonehenge, sure. Malta, the big uh, dolmens and stuff that they have over in Asia and everything, uh, you know, Arthur's Table, all that sort of stuff. You don't think about there being huge megaliths here in Montana. Uh -huh. But in fact, the Giants Playground, which isn't far from the capital, has got a whole bunch of megaliths in it, including the Tizer Dolmen, which is the largest dolmen on Earth. Oh, really? Yeah. I had so no there apparently that. wasn't any shortage of giants around here. <laughs> do you, how do you spell Tizer? I'm just curious. T-I-Z-E-R. T-I-Z-E-R Dolmen. I'm just looking it up on Google here. Oh, my God. Yeah. No, wow. <laughs> yeah, it's like ridiculously big. And you're looking at that going, well, how in the hell did they make that without heavy equipment? And then you look at the area around it. There's no place to park heavy equipment. Yeah. Right. Wow. And that I'm going to drag it over to the to the other screen so that our listeners can <laughs> see it. But you can see that this thing is, it's clearly a megalithic structure. It's not anything naturally occurring. That, oh, my God. Wow. Yeah, and it's the the typical dolmen. It's got the, the um, you know, three or four standing stones. It's got the flat stone laid across the top of it like you find all over the planet. That is amazing. Wow. And And how tall is this? Can you... Uh, geez, I think it's like uh, 50, 60 feet. You'd have to look it up to be specific on it, but it's gigantic. That is incredible. Uh, uh, that is amazing. I'd never even heard of this before, but I'm I'm absolutely intrigued. At what yeah, see, here we are in the middle of giant and paranormal central, and nobody <laughs> even knows any of this stuff is going on. When I, when I first started doing uh, live in the field research videos and stuff, when I had my uh, little group over on Facebook, Montana Bigfoot Project, there was a lot of people that were like, oh, there's no... There's no Bigfoot in Montana. They're all over in Washington. <laughs> and like, well, how do you think they trained them to not cross the border and come over here? Because I hate to tell you, those woods are all connected. There's the Blue Mountain Range runs right over here and connects to the Bitterroots right next to where I'm living. Come on, Duke. And that's where Teddy Roosevelt's encounter uh, story that he told was. You can see the lines on all the maps, Duke. <laughs> yeah, come on, you can read yeah. it. They, no, Bigfoot <laughs> doesn't have the map. Nobody gave it to him. He doesn't know how to read it. doesn't care. <laughs> That is the truth, though, and that was what, uh, you know, I have to admit that, you know, way back, way back when I see I had an, an encounter, I never saw it, but it was right behind me and growled. And I lived down in Lake Pepin. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with that area. Being a fellow. Yeah, as a matter of fact, I lived in Lake City for about three years. Oh, did you? Okay. So I was just north yep. of you in a town uh, called Red Wing, actually in Wakuda, but uh, that's where I grew up, and I was up on the bluffs there. Hiking down, a friend, in my, a friend of mine and I were hiking down a ravine there uh, near Frontenac State Park. And uh, s we got down to this bowl of this ravine, and suddenly something was right behind us and growling in such a way that it shook our whole bodies. And now th this is southern Minnesota where the biggest thing is a whitetail. You know what I mean? <laughs> there's just yeah. there's nothing. Yeah, there aren't there. even any bear around there. No. There's just but here nothing was, for big predators. Right, but there was this this rumbling growl, and it just... I mean, we were frozen, and and finally we just said, "What do you want? You know, what is it? We don't know. I don't know. Let's get out of here." And we just ran. We ran down this rocky ravine, and how we made it to the bottom without breaking ourselves in half, I don't know. <laughs> but it was, it was just like I thought I was going to die. That's all I can tell you is I felt like I was going to die. Whatever that was that made that sound was so big and so ferocious that I I couldn't I couldn't bring myself to turn my head to see what it was. I didn't want to know, you know. And, uh, yeah. you know, this is down there. But I, when it happened, after that fact, this is when I was 14, 15 years old, I didn't have any any knowledge of Bigfoot except of on search of, and they were over in the uh, Pacific or Olympic Peninsula. <laughs> you know, they were over there and in California. They weren't in Minnesota. So I was just dumbfounded oh. until, you know, it's, it was like this information took so long to filter down that, no, wait, they're everywhere. <laughs> yeah. You know? Well, I got the head start on you way back in 72 when I saw one in northern Minnesota and then again in 77, so I knew they were around there. Yeah. So whenever I was out in the woods after that, when I got to the point where I didn't feel like I needed to be armed like Rambo and have a team of killer special forces <laughs> with me to go into the woods, um, I would actually, that was one of the things that i do. i go for hikes and stuff, and occasionally I was hunting or whatever, but I'd always you know, find tracks or 
mm-hmm. likely areas they could be hanging around. Mm-hmm. I was down Frontenac and looked around down there. And like I said, I lived in Lake City for like three years. Wow. And I heard three local reports that I doubt are in the, the database of people that actually saw Bigfoot in that area. So it doesn't surprise me at all if one of them had chased you out of there. Yeah, I'm sure it did. Um, <laughs> and and it was it was years later, of course, when I started getting the information, started learning what people what signs people attribute to them, and then went back up into those woods, maybe you know, ten, fifteen years ago, and went back up into those woods and started finding some of those very things, like broken off saplings that are like six inches around, broken with no deadfall anywhere near them, snapped down, mm-hmm. and uh, a little structure that was built with broken logs. And uh, I, you know, I was like, oh, my God, they are here. That's what that's what it was. And it was it was kind of good and a, and a healing thing because it, it made finally made that incident make sense. It's like, OK, now I know what happened. I'd never knew for all yeah. those years. It was just this weird thing that happened that just terrified the hell out of me. Now, at least you have a likely suspect now. You don't have to keep running it back and forth in your mind a million times going, <laughs> I don't know what came after me. <laughs> well, the, yeah, and that's it. It's it's kind of like your your situation where you, you kind of forgot about it because there was nothing you could do with it. Right. And then yeah. once, then then it just kind of resurfaced when I got into Bigfoot, and I was like, oh, wait a minute. Yeah, I remember that happened. And I'm really glad it happened with somebody with me because then I couldn't just dismiss it as, oh, you know, maybe that's a false memory or something in my you know in my mind. But... The person with me, of course, remembers it too. So that's just really bizarre. So. I can't even tell you how many times I've had people talk to me where they've had, you know, a, a good sighting where there was no doubt what they were seeing, even you know during the daytime, right. fairly close range, and then they get interested in Bigfoot and they start looking up more information on it, and they, it scares them because yeah. they start going, "Oh my God, I was probably near these things a bunch of times, and I didn't know what I was doing. You know, <laughs> I didn't know what I was hearing, I didn't know what I was seeing. Mm-hmm. You know." Trees don't naturally get ripped out of the ground and then shoved point first back into the ground again. <laughs> it's, no, it's true. Trees yeah. don't do cartwheels and get stuck halfway over. Something else <laughs> is doing that. Yeah. Um, so, you know, and after they start seeing all that, then they get really creeped out, you know, mm-hmm. and I, uh, I can't blame them, but at least it's like, well, you know, all these weird little things that happened while you're out in the woods, now you've got something that all this sort of stuff seems to be tied in with this one creature and if you're in these areas where these critters are usually around, it's probably what it was. Right. So look on the bright side. It didn't, like, mash you with a boulder or something. <laughs> you were around them a bunch of times, and they didn't really come after you or anything. So you can't be that deadly, right? right. Well, and that's that's the other part of it, right, is that, you know, I really think that uh, clearly by by physical ability ability alone, if they wanted us dead, we would be we would be mushy piles, and that's it. <laughs> mushy piles. You know, I mean, they, we would have no no physical recourse other than, you know, having the you know the ability to be armed and prepared, and even then, you know, it's it's a gamble as quick as these things are, that if you're in a in a real hyper state of panic, can you actually pull out a, a weapon and use it? Well, you know, some I don't think most people could, to be honest with you. And no, yeah. especially at the speed they move. If they're intent on grabbing you or something, they're not going to be dumb and charge you like a hundred yards across an open field. Right. Right. They're yeah. going to sit behind a big tree and wait until you walk past it, and then just reach out and clothesline you. Yeah, yeah. You're going to be just already in a real bad place. So yep. the yep. the fact that they don't, you know, aggressively go after people, and that usually usually seems like territorial posturing more than anything. I think that's pretty reassuring but you know knowing that there's there's the other things out there that part is tough because you don't know where they're going to turn up right. but do you find that they're generally pretty territorial between them like uh you know so for instance the type ones wouldn't probably be real pleased about a wendigo crossing over their property or things like that do you have any opinion on that um the only information i've gotten direct on that one is again from people up in alaska that have talked about it and one person that was sitting right on the border between two territories Oh, okay. And uh, they had a very interesting story, which I've never actually told on air before. Um, they were out hunting. I think they were hunting for, I think it was bighorn sheep. Anyway, you know, that's the Alaska thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Freezer's empty. Go shoot a huge animal. Fill freezer. <laughs> so anyway, uh, uh, the person in question's out there walking along, and they're going through this wooded area on a hillside. And they went into an area that they had never gone into before. Now, about 15, 20 minutes before they got into this area, the person realized they were being followed. Mm. And they even started, like, paying attention. And being that this person is very sly and extremely militarily trained, 
They actually caught a couple of glimpses of it and went, oh, it's juveniles from the local troop is following me for some reason, which kind of creeped him out. Like, why is he following me? This, right. this isn't cool, you know. <clears throat> so finally the person op- uh, came out into an opening, which was a uh, you know, small field, wasn't that big. And uh, on the side of the opening of, you know, where it came out of the woods into the field, there was a huge X structure. And they looked at that and went, mm, somebody's got a marker here. This might be somebody else's territory. I don't know if I should go in here. But they were really creeped out by the one that was right behind them and wanted to get out in the open to get a little distance away from them. Mm-hmm. So continued on their way across the field, went into the woods on the other side about uh, 40, 50 feet, and kind of ducked around a tree and just hugged there for a second and looked back. And sure enough, here it came out of the wood line, was going to go across the field following them, took about three steps, and a Wendigo jumped it. Oh, yeah. And the, the witness's description said that, quote, it tore this thing apart like a human would rip a piece of paper apart. Wow. Oh, my God. They were so freaked out, they just basically screamed and ran for it. They gave up on hunting and never went into that, that area again when they had to hunt. Wow. Um, so, yeah, this is, you know, this is from the eyewitness. Yeah, it got jumped by one of those big carnivorous ones, and it shredded this juvenile Bigfoot like he was like nothing. Oh, my God. Wow. That, what, that actually what do you makes, say? Yeah, I don't know. That's one of those things. It's like wow. when you witness it, it's, uh, I don't know. I, I would just, I think I would just stand there drooling, just going, I don't know how to process this. Because they were, I would have done the same thing they did, scream and run. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, they passed this thing then. They were, they, and it chose not yeah. to go after them. It was okay to let the hunter go past. But when somebody from another troop that wasn't supposed to be there tried to walk across the boundary. Wow. Oh my God, and you got to wonder then: Would that be? Would that? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, obviously nobody could know, but would that be an act of aggression? Then that then the other troop of the rest of the Bigfoots would go, "Hey, hell no! They just tore up Jimmy. You know, let's go get him." Yeah. You know. I, now, from what I gather from the the folks up there that have had anything to say about it, and believe me, people are tight lipped on this subject, is that it sounds like the Type Fours don't even operate in groups; they're solitary. Oh. It's like a big old polar bear. It huh. doesn't need a group. Oh, okay. So they so are... it probably doesn't have an area that's all that big, but you damn well better not walk into it. <laughs> oh, jeez, that just stuns me. I'm just like, I'm like, I'm feeling like a big swell of pity for that little yeah, bigfoot. It's like, oh, poor guy. He just wanted to. Play. I know that's how I felt the first time too, because I figured it was just one of the local troop members that maybe even knew she was that, that this person was going the wrong way. Yeah. And was about to walk into a territory where these type fours were. <laughs> and, you know, who knows what it had in mind if it was going to try and, you know, jump her and haul her off for a cave trophy or if it was just concerned and wanted to keep an eye on her and make sure one of these other things didn't get her. But whatever the case was, it shouldn't have crossed that, uh, you know, and this, again, one of the reasons why I think the X's are territorial markers because as soon as it walked past this thing, rippity shred. Right. <laughs> Wow. And that's it. And that's what the witness said. It got three steps past it, and this thing had just like literally leaped out of the wood line. Oh Neither God. one of them had seen it, and it was right on top of it in one jump. Oh wow. man, that is just wow. That's like the you know your Jurassic Park when the T Rex just blows out of the woods and, and eats those littler things. It's like, uh. <laughs> yep, oh. yeah. And you know who knows what it had in mind as far as the person that was hunting after it got rid of the smaller one. Was it going to go trail them and right. you know, eat them? did it have in mind no thanks <laughs> you know the hunter had enough savvy to get the heck out of there and not get, not get a chance to find out what it had intended right now when they have in language right would you would agree with that that they have a a pretty uh, co- uh complex language it sure seems like it i mean if you go if you uh, believe the sierra sounds are real um it's definitely been studied by some people that are kind of expert on that sort of thing and they've come to the conclusion it is some kind of language mm-hmm. they're speaking really fast um it also seems like they can make sounds at a higher and low, lower range than we can actually hear they may be able to hear in a little bit more expanded range than we can mm-hmm. So they could, like, do a high-pitched chirp that a dog would hear, like a dog whistle, but we wouldn't hear it. Huh. Oh, okay. And maybe that's how they communicate when, when we don't well, hear it. Well, and anything. another thing that, you know, people always talk about, uh, uh, Bigfoot's in your, Bigfoot walks up on your camp, all of a sudden everything goes dead still. Yes, yes. Okay. Think about it. The little animal 
people operate in hyper if you blew a dog whistle they'd hear it too so maybe this thing is just making some kind of noise we can't hear and all the little critters shut up right away right Uh, including insects and that's the creepy part it's like even even bugs which don't seem to be aware of much of anything like they shut the hell up too when those things happen. It's just like yeah. no sound. Well, I mean, think of like you know frogs and stuff like that. They can hear it in the same range we can and stuff. You throw a rock in the pond, they'll shut up for a while. Yeah. Uh, you know, to them, if there's some kind of a hypersonic uh, sound that they're emitting, like you know, again using the the corollary of the dog whistle, it could be piercing ridiculously loud. We wouldn't hear it, mm-hmm. but it would sure scare the hell out of all these small animals, including insects, yeah. and they'd all shut up for a while. Yeah. Good point. Now. Um... I've experienced that one time in this area, and uh, what was going on is uh, uh, some old friends of mine had a had a uh, house up on uh, up on a mountain trail uh, near here, and it's it's not real far away, about twenty minute drive. But um, the husband was out uh, on a business trip and was away, and the wife and the small child were home alone. And she called me and said, "I don't know what's going on. The dog won't quit barking. They got a German Shepherd." And the dog was just going crazy. Never had done this before. Never had gone off like this in, you know, in the couple of years that they lived there. But the dog would not, go, would not quiet down. It was just going absolutely ballistic. And uh, she's like, can you come up? I don't know what to do. And I'm like, well, sure, I'll go up there. Now, <laughs> I get in my car and go up there. And I, you know, I, never, I didn't see anything. I really didn't. But I'll tell you, I got out of my car, quieted the dog down. And, and it was that creepy, creepy stillness. Mm-hmm. And it was just dead. There was not even a cricket chirping. And I stayed there and walked around the, the perimeter of the house, just kept shining a flashlight everywhere, you know, just looking. Because, I mean, it could be, you know, bears or whatever, too. I don't know. But I just know that it's just eerie quiet. And I'm listening with all of my strength to try to hear anything crunching or walking, and I'm not hearing a thing. And then it's like, I, all I can tell you is that I felt it as much as I heard it, that suddenly the air just lightened. And then slowly the crickets started chirping again. And it was like, oh, okay. And it, it was like everything returned to normal. And the dog's hackles finally went down. And, and it was like something was there. But it was that whole stillness thing. And it's just, it's really incredibly unnerving. Yeah. The other thing that you can't use um, infrasound or ultrasound to explain away is the instances where you get this situation happening. And not only are all the bugs and the other critters quiet, there's no wind. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's true, too. You can't do that with uh, any kind of sonic anything. You can't make the wind stop. Sorry. Mm-hmm. Big, not within Bigfoot's capability. So, there, you know, again, this is one of those weird things where it's like, well, you can maybe come up with part of an explanation, but it doesn't, it doesn't fit everything all the time. Because yeah. I've been in situations like that, too, where it's like not only are all the animals quiet, the wind just stopped, too. Yeah. And now that you mentioned that, I, I, I didn't pay attention to remember if there was any wind or not. It was just that stillness. But, I mean, there wasn't wind, but I don't know if there was after that either. But you're right. I've heard of those accounts, too, where people are just, even the wind quiets down, like the whole forest is just holding its breath. That's... And that's plenty creepy. <laughs> I agree. I agree because that just that really implies something incredibly supernatural. And of course, on the portal, we we discuss things like that. Like there are there are these spiritual presences as well that don't really manifest completely, but they they're there, maybe just out of phase from us or something. <laughs> but they just seem to you know they go where they want, and and when they're around, it's like people. Yeah, but you know, here's the interesting thing, Duke, and this is something that's occurred to me that. Maybe it's a memory of our past or something, but we all seem to have that sixth sense. We know when we're being watched. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so I don't know what that is, but unfortunately we're down to under the two-minute mark. I want you to be able to tell people how to keep in touch with you, keep following what you're doing. Uh, If you would, please, let everybody know. All right. Well, come check out the channel at our main and primary base over on YouTube, World Bigfoot Radio, uh, and also... Um, we're setting up a new website. We almost got her completely done and, and uh, ready to be on there full time here shortly. For right now, it's got all the shows on it. So we're keeping up on that. We're going to have a board on there where people can uh, talk to each other without fear of troll interference. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and also post things from other people that are, you know, really good shows or newsworthy items that if you're interested in the whole Bigfoot subject, you should check out. Um, next show up, I'm really happy with and looking forward to putting it out here because I got uh, biblical scholar Gary Wayne coming. 
working on, and he's going to be weighing in on Bigfoot in the Bible and Ooh. what is Bigfoot. Wow. So, wow. Um, super, super psyched to be doing that show. And um, also, um, you know, let's see, where else am I? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, let's see. I'm on uh, Minds.com, Gab, and I'm setting up on BitChute, so you should be able to start getting my shows there shortly. Oh, yeah, check and us I'm out also on BitChute, at- too. Get us on there, too, uh, Duke. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's actually the platform is really nice. The sound and video quality is better than YouTube is. Okay. Um, so I recommend it for especially anybody that thinks their channel might be deleted for no decipherable reason. Go there, <laughs> set up a backup base. There you go. All right, ladies and, and gentlemen. Me we. Oh, Come yeah. find me on MeWe instead of Facebook. M-E-W-E. No trolls. Awesome groups. Come find me there. All right, guys. Well, we love you all. Be good, be kind, be nice. Stick around for... Uh, uh, Beyond the Veil coming up next. It might be a live episode. I'm not sure, but the studio, I think, has come together in there. So we love you all. We'll be back tomorrow night for the bedtime stories. Take care, everybody. <laughs> Censorship and regulation is becoming an ever-growing...